Okay, everybody. I'm gonna get started. I hope the uh, I hope the sound is working good. If it isn't, give me a little thumbs up or thumbs down. But uh, we're gonna get started tonight. We got a lot to cover, so <coughs> thanks for coming out. What we're uh, what we're planning to do tonight is share with you some of the uh, exciting real estate investing ideas that myself and and my partner Jeremy Ricci have been doing, and. Uh, we want to share it with you. We want to give you some detailed information about the kind of things that we're doing because we really, we really love it. We want to share it with you. And we also uh, are going to give you some specific uh, information that you can take with you about what we're doing. So let's get started. Give you a quick introduction of myself. Uh, everybody calls me uh, Philly Phil because I'm from Philadelphia. And uh, I live in Warminster now. Warminster Phil just doesn't work. So <laughs> Philly Phil is much better. So well, I started in this business in 1989 at the age of 23, and uh, I just love this business. I, uh, I, I, I don't do anything except real estate investing. I don't want to do anything else. I don't see myself doing anything else the rest of my life. I really love it. And I always say, get busy buying, okay? I, I've been saying that ever since like 2010, because what I see after being through in, in this business for 23 years, I see just an absolutely amazing opportunity to buy real estate. And I, I, I tell people about that all the time because I want to see them benefit from it. Okay? I'm, I'm canceling all my vacations. That's, that's what a great opportunity I think it is right now. I don't want to waste a single minute of not being around to make real estate deals. So, uh, you know, I plan to, to, to buy as much real estate as humanly possible in the next five years or so, and then uh, enjoy the rest of my life living off that portfolio. That's the plan. So, uh, you can ask me in five years how, how I made out with it. We could talk about it. Uh, what kind of investor am I? I'm primarily a buy and hold investor. I do all kinds of different real estate deals, but the main object for me is to keep as much of the properties as I can. Now, I, I don't have a job, so I have to generate income for myself from time to time, so I'll wholesale deals or sell deals when I have to, but only enough to, uh, to provide for whatever uh, financial needs I have at the time and keep as much 
of the properties as possible. So uh, what am I going to do with them all, uh, with this uh, huge portfolio that I intend to build on top of what I already have? Uh, probably going to sell it all at the top of the market in 1031, all that money into commercial real estate, which is what I did in the first real estate cycle that I went through. And uh, you can read a lot about that in my book, uh, but um, what I consider myself to be today is a deal engineer. I, I spend the bulk of my time every day looking for real estate deals, analyzing the deals and trying to uh, make the best real estate deals that I can possibly make. And I can tell you that the, every deal we do is just seems to be better than the next. This particular market and it's, you know having all this experience, it's just come to a certain point where uh, making tremendous deals is something that seems to become easier and easier in this market. This is my book, Addicted to Real Estate. I tell people it's $20 for 20 years experience. So, and actually it's 23 years experience, so that's even less than a buck a year. It's more like 93 cents or something a year. Uh, but I, what I really want to show you is the front cover of the book. Because to me, this picture represents <coughs> everything that my uh, philosophy is all about. Uh, here's my wife and she's saying, Phil, honey, are you listening? And I'm not listening because uh, I'm addicted to real estate, so why would I be listening? And uh, the balloon over my head says, uh, a $12 million portfolio with a 7% annual increase is $840,000 a year in equity. So what's my point? The point is, if you could acquire enough cash flow and property, and, and maybe a $12 million portfolio sounds like a really huge number, but I can assure you if, you if you did nothing else all day long but look for properties, it's a very achievable number. And asking for a 7% annual increase is not a huge thing to ask for. I mean, uh, it certainly feels like a huge thing right now, but history will show you that there's been, you know, the bulk of the years, that that was the average number that real estate went up 7%. So if you're holding a $12 million portfolio and 7% on an increase, you just made 840 grand a year in equity and you don't have to pay any taxes on that money. And the key thing here is that I'm, I'm sitting on a beach, okay? Uh, now, you might be able to uh, make a $840,000 a year in equity if you were, say, a CEO of a corporation making $1.4 million a year, but I guarantee you're not sitting on a beach. You're probably stressed out of your mind. So my point is, is that the real estate not only lends itself to be a multimillionaire rather easily if you make the right decisions, but you can also have control of your life and be sitting on a beach and enjoying your uh, success. So that's what, I, that's what I focus on. I even tell people, you don't even need to read my book. Okay, all you have to do is buy it, prop it up, and look at this picture. Because it'll tell you everything you need to know. Okay, so uh, let's get started with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out for you uh, a scenario that happens to me a lot. This is, this is my truck. And uh, I, so I'm very subtle about what I do for a living. I drive around with this giant billboard with 18-inch uh, uh, high letters on the side of the vehicle that I buy houses. I get a ton of phone calls from this. Now, uh, Jeremy and I do all different kinds of marketing strategies, but this is one of my favorites because you, you pay a couple of grand to get your vehicle wrapped, and it becomes a nonstop advertising machine for you. I get uh, phone calls. I got an appointment on Thursday of this week from somebody who saw my truck, uh, and it just comes in perfect flow. Uh, one of the problems, if you drop a marketing package out to say a neighborhood that you want to buy, sometimes what happens is your phone rings off the wall. Now you spend all this money on this marketing, so now you got to go out and look at all these properties, meet with all these people, and it all comes in one big um, slam. And I prefer to have it come to me in phone calls once a week in a way where I can handle them in the way that they should be handled. So uh, let's just say, for example, I'm driving down the street and someone sees my truck and he calls, calls the number and he says, hey, you just drove past my house. Turn around, I, I want to talk to you about buying my house, okay? The reason I use this example is because this would be an example where I have no knowledge of the house whatsoever. All I know is the address. I been a U-turn, I pull in the person's driveway, <clears throat> and I get into their house, okay? So the first thing that I try to do is I try to uh, make them feel comfortable with me. I want them to, uh, to know me, like me, trust me, and I want to do that as quickly as I can. So I try to accomplish that five, ten minutes of, of some personable talk, and then I ask for a tour of the house. 
okay? And when I get the tour of the house, uh, I also want that to be quick because I'm a busy guy. We have a lot to talk about. If I'm going to buy this person's house and I'm lucky enough to get to the point where they're going to sign a contract with me, I'm going to be there for hours. So I want what the first thing I want to do is get a quick tour of the house. And what always happens is, you know, they want to make it a half an hour tour of their house. So it's a tricky thing. You don't want to insult them but you want to get out of there quick. So usually what happens is there used to be a wall here and my husband took it down and they want to tell you the whole story and you somehow have to move them along to the point where you're asking them questions. Uh, what are those questions? I have, a, I have a special form that I give to people that tells you exactly the questions that you, that you want to be asking them. Things like what, are the, what is their house worth and uh, do they have a mortgage? And what do they perceive? You know, what do they perceive that their their house would sell for? Things like that. And then I take that information, and I very quickly assess what kind of uh, acquisition strategy can be applied to this person's house. Okay. I haven't gone on the MLS and done any research. I don't have any computer program I'm using. Uh, I didn't even have a chance to go on my phone and look on something like Zillow, which only takes a couple of minutes. I just spun my truck around, jumped in the guy's driveway, and immediately began to see the house and discuss the scenario of the house. So the next thing that's coming to my mind is, uh, what can my future tenants afford? Okay, Because if, if my strategy is to buy and hold as much real estate as possible, this property is ultimately going to be in the hands of a tenant. And a tenant's going to be the one who's paying all the bills, not me. So I want to show you the math. Uh, before I do that, this is just a form that I use to uh, analyze each piece of real estate. I put stars next to uh, all the important questions that I have to ask them. And I fill out every single house that I look at, which can be sometimes four or five a week. Uh, I, or even if I'm on the phone with them, I use the same form. I fill out every single form exactly the same way and I keep them all. And the reason I do that is because a lot of times people aren't interested in selling me their house the first time they see me, but they call me up three months, six months. I've had them call me up a year later. And all I have to do is find the form and I already know uh, at least what I thought at the time. So I wanted to lay out uh, one method of buying the house that I'm going to share with you tonight, which is seller financing, and the way that I think about the deal uh, as I'm talking to the person. Okay, So for those of you who don't know what seller financing is, a typical house that would be free and clear, for example, would be a wonderful house to go immediately to a seller financed discussion. Basically, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the owner to become the mortgage company. And I'm going to try to buy this house with them financing the whole thing for me. If anybody's seen my web TV show, my tagline for what I love to do is I buy houses with none of my own money, without the support of banks, I get to keep the properties, and sometimes I get paid to buy them. So the first key to this thing is if I'm going to buy a house with none of my own money, I have to get somebody <laughs> to finance this house for me, okay? Not just the down payment, but even the mortgage. Because when you have a huge portfolio uh, like I do, it's pretty hard to get uh, loans from a bank, uh, no matter what your credit or no matter what your financial situation is. They just they don't want to be the 37th mortgage getting paid every month. So what I have on this slide here that I want to share with you is, is the, the mindset that's going on uh, as I'm talking to this person. So the first thing I'm thinking to myself is, well, what can this property rent for? And in this typical scenario, and this is going to, we're going to say this is a free and clear house. This typical scenario, the house is going to rent for $1,295 a month. So the first thing I do is I'm taking $300 a month cash flow off this right off the bat. Now, $300 a month cash flow on a house, if, if I'm going to rent it for $1,295, it might be a $150,000 house or something somewhere between 100 and 200, you know, it could be anything, depends on where it is. But $300 a month cash flow is something I immediately want to always try to get because that basically means I'm breaking even, I'm not even making any money, okay? 
uh, I'll have years where the house is rented and I'll make every dime of that money, but the next year the roof will go and the, H and the heater will go and I'll make nothing. So $300 a month is, is an absolute something that you must achieve, okay? The next thing I think about is what are the taxes, what are the insurance, and maybe there's some condo fees or any other potential expenses. And I come down to a number of 685. So I know in my head right now, very quickly, that if I buy this person's house, I can't pay them any more than $685 a month. I certainly don't want to start at that number either. So I'm going to trim off of that number, and I'm going to start talking to them about the sale price of the house. Now, the sale price of the house in a seller finance deal is actually not really that important. Uh, in this scenario, I wrote the sales price is 100 grand. It could be 200 grand. It could be it could be 300 grand. It doesn't matter. Uh, what I try to do is I want to give them their price within reason. I want to pay them their price. So, for example, if I'm sitting at the kitchen table with them, and they say, "Well, you know, this house is worth 150 grand, and that's what that's what I want for it," I say, "Okay." <laughs> now, every guy who they probably will talk to, if they talk to a hundred guys about buying their house, every single one of them is going to go in there and lowball them. I'm not going to do that at all. I'm going to pay them the price, and the reason I want to do that is now I got their attention. There's no question about it. They're very, very interested to hear what's coming out of my mouth in the next five minutes. So what I talk to them about is, you know, in this scenario, let's just say, you know, they said it was a uh, hundred kegs. That's what I wrote on this example. Uh, I might start by offering them five hundred dollars a month for two hundred months. Five hundred dollars a month times two hundred months is a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, and. For me, if they would accept that deal, uh, that is an absolutely wonderful deal, okay? That's a home run uh, every day of the week and twice on Sunday, okay? And let me explain why, in, in case you don't know. Uh, we never discussed uh, interest rates or anything like that, okay? I basically said, you want 100 grand? I'm going to give you 100 grand, okay? <laughs> They're, they're, and, and then what happens is I'm making $500 a month payments to them. There's no interest on this loan. And what happens is every penny of the $500 a month that I pay to them, which I'm not even paying, my tenants are paying, uh, goes towards principal. Okay? So if they accepted my first offer of $500 a month, I planned on making $300, but I'm actually $185 below the amount I said I could pay. So I'm cash flowing 400. Hey, I'm cash flowing 485 dollars a month. In addition to that, I'm getting 500 dollars a month in principal pay down. Okay, that is that is a tremendous deal. Now, if you did nothing but look for these kind of deals, they're not easy to find, but you can find them if you're dedicated to looking for this kind of deal. And if you are, uh, your net worth will will go up uh, very quickly. Uh, with each deal that you do. There's always a troublemaker in every meeting. Wrapping is a technique that we use, but uh, we don't shy away from owning real estate. Uh, uh, being a guy who's addicted to real estate, I don't have much of a choice. So my goal is to make sure that I've acquired the house with none of my own money, without the support of banks, and I want to keep the property, okay? So my plan is to keep the home, and, and, and to me, this is a tremendous deal. Just think of this, Ken. Imagine if I had $10,000 a month in mortgage payments that were being made on seller-financed deals. Would, do you understand that my net worth is going up by $10,000 a month not counting the cash flow, the appreciation, the depreciation, all the other benefits of a piece of real estate. Okay? If the market stayed flat for the next 20 years, I'd still be a, a very wealthy man from this deal. So if you had a bunch of these deals, if you had, say, $10,000 a month in, in, in seller finance mortgage payments, this is a tremendous way to buy a house. I would, I would never discount this. Uh, I, I love to buy houses with seller financing. When I see a sign like in this picture, owner finance, I lock up the brakes. Okay. And uh, I get my uh, 
itself over to the door. So let's talk a little bit more about this kind of deal for a minute. Um, one thing that will happen is occasionally uh, somebody will say, you know, that they want to receive an interest payment. And <clears throat> what I explained to them is, is that I'm not asking for a loan here. Now, if you have money to lend me and you would like to receive an interest payment on that, I certainly have a program for that. I, I work with private investors all the time. I do buy properties uh, all different kinds of ways. But in this case, you're not lending me any money. You're not, there's no transaction of uh, you handing me money. What you're handing me is a house that you're having most likely a difficult time selling. And I've agreed to pay above today's price for this house in exchange for you to provide me with the financing. Okay? So I'm giving them their terms, her, in this scenario, the terms where they wanted 100 grand. And uh, I'm sorry, the sales price, they wanted 100 grand. And my terms were how much I was willing to pay them, which were $500 a month. And they accepted that. I would have negotiated higher in this example. But for the purpose of this example, I want to explain that. Uh, because the point to, to understanding these deals is that this is a financing business. Okay? It's not necessarily just about bricks and sticks and fix and toilets. It's about financing. If you don't understand the, the financing of a real estate business, then you need to really learn that. And, and Jeremy and I are two excellent guys to learn that from because we put a tremendous amount of energy and effort into that aspect, that this is a financing business. Now, if you understand all the different ways that things can be financed, you can make almost any deal work. So it's really critical information. Um, I tell people that the market is talking to you. Right? I, years ago, I used to buy commercial buildings. And, and that's all I did. I chased big commercial buildings. And I owned some fairly large buildings. But at a certain point, I had to, I had to stop and, and, and look at the market and say, you know, in 2008, 2009, when the economy started to, to come down, I said, this, this might not be the smartest move going after commercials. So what is the market telling me to buy? Well, it's telling me to buy houses. Now, I grew up in this business buying houses, and then I started to fuel my ego with these big commercial buildings, and it felt great. I, I, I almost got myself in a whole lot of trouble because I was very aggressive buying commercial buildings. But then I came to the realization that if the market is going to put out, you know, of millions of properties every year that are in foreclosure and those foreclosures are going to drag down the price of the houses that aren't in foreclosure and add tremendous inventory out there then the market is talking to me it's telling me exactly what I should be investing in I should be investing in houses so what I did was I, I came back to the real estate investing strategies that I started my career with and and then I'm focusing on that and nothing else right now and I can tell you that the upside to it is tremendous, and the downside is, is almost non-existent. Where in commercial real estate, you buy a big building for three, four million dollars, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. But go out and buy yourself uh, eight quarter of a million dollar houses, and that's two million dollars. And you, it's pretty hard to screw these up. They're easy to do if you know what you're doing, right? So I'm going to take what the market has given me, and I'm going to look for motivation, not desperation. What I mean by that is it, if you chase nothing but foreclosures, you're typically dealing with people who are in a very desperate situation. Well, I can assure you that if there's a neighborhood with 400 houses, and there might be uh, 15 of them that are for sale on the MLS right now, and there might be another 15 that are coming in foreclosure, there's probably 15 more that aren't in foreclosure and aren't for sale and would love to sell, but they don't even believe that that's a possibility because they don't know about these techniques and they don't know me. And if they did, <laughs> I could come in and make some kind of deal like this. So this is something that Jeremy and I focus on all the time. We, we pick neighborhoods that we like. We drop marketing there. And we try to buy properties in this way. Another thing you're, you're going to learn about tonight is that we, know, we, um, we don't use banks. We use private lenders in a case of a, 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 we use private lenders or we use some kind of seller financing. So it's one of the reasons that I love seller financing is because I don't have to deal with banks. I don't have to sign my name personally. I don't have to risk if this particular property becomes a failure, 
then, then I don't have to worry about them coming and taking everything else that I've spent my life building. Okay, so uh, no banks. We don't like to, you know, sign personally and guarantee money. And conventional deals, you know, are pr you know, I say they're dead. They're not really dead. I mean, I still buy things off the MLS from time to time. But, but when you learn how to do these strategies, you're going to find that you're much better off using, you know, the kind of strategies we're going to share with you tonight as opposed to buying conventional deals. So Jeremy will talk about that a little bit. One thing, Phil, I was reading a lot of the meetup responses, and a lot of you guys, I put a little questionnaire in the meetup thing after a little while, and what, what I heard a lot of was the one thing that was keeping you from doing the deals that you want to do in real estate was the money side. So we kind of catered uh, this, a lot of this presentation towards, towards the money side, so whether it's seller financing, and we have some other various reasons of seller financing, also private money. If you could buy houses without using banks, how many people here could buy more houses? Yeah, so, I mean, it's pretty obvious that, you know, how many people here have always used banks, banks are fine? Is anybody here recently still investing and using banks, and it's going well? Okay. <laughs> the mortgage lender. <laughs> um, uh, you know, not to say that there aren't, aren't banks that are that are lending money. There are, but we're just finding that w the velocity of money is really what propels you in this business. And the velocity of money is how fast could you get in, get the deal signed, get it closed. We just closed the deal in uh, in Doylestown uh, last week, Friday, was it? Yep. So we closed the deal on Friday. That was a great great house in Doylestown. And if we had to use a bank to do it, it would have been months before we close that deal for all the approvals. It's nice to know, you know, we could just go in, use, in this case, it was private money. But, um, you know, that's kind of what we're catering to. You, you guys have said in all the meetups that you want to learn how to do things with seller financing, do things that don't involve banks, and uh, we heard that, so. Sorry for the idea. Uh, no, I'll be sorry. Probably. So, uh, another kind of deal we're going to talk about tonight a little bit, we'll talk about private money deals. For those of you who don't know what they are, essentially what we're doing is we're buying houses for cash. You're going to find people who say, look, I don't want to hear about this seller financing. Uh, you know, you, you seem like a nice guy, but I don't want to hear about that. It's not going to work for me. I need, uh, I need somebody to buy my house and give me a bulk sum of cash, okay? So <clears throat> that's obviously going to happen. So uh, if any of you, by the way, if any of you ever have applied for a, a bank loan and they ask for your proof of funds, I just email them this picture right here, <laughs> all right? It's good for a laugh, at least. Yeah, there's your proof of funds right there. I said I was going to buy for cash, right? So uh, <clears throat> what we primarily do is uh, we find a great deal that we definitely want, but we can't uh, acquire it through any seller financing means. And what we want to do in that situation is we're going to offer them a much lower price. It's going to be theoretically the lowest price that we're, uh, the lowest offer that we're going to be capable of giving them. If it's a cash offer, uh, typically, I like to start somewhere around 40% uh, of what I think the house is worth. So I do a quick analyzation, figure out what the house is worth, and I'm going to offer them approximately 40% of that number. And you're going to get a lot of rejections that way, but I have to respect the, the, the cash and the private lenders that I have available to lend me money. I can't afford to waste their money on one house when I've already told